Can you imagine a world where every fighter jet is accompanied by a loyal wingman drone, one controlled by the pilot while flying at high speeds? Well, the U.S. Air Force can. It's called the Collaborative Combat Aircraft Program, and the service is convinced that this is the future of air warfare. Breaking Defense has assembled a panel to talk about this very important topic, and it starts right now. Collaborative combat aircraft, it's maybe the hottest topic for the Air Force right now, maybe the hottest topic for anybody who's flying a jet right now. Um, my question to you, Michael Morrow, is what is a CCA? Yeah, it's at a very basic level. It's a drone that can fly and fight alongside uh, a fighter jet, uh, you know, maybe other aircraft platforms in the future. But uh, essentially, this CCA topic came about as a, as a formal program in the fiscal year 2024 budget uh, when the Air Force unveiled it last year. And it's drawing from years of work across the Pentagon, uh, from programs with DARPA, uh, like the Air Combat Evolution Program. If you saw Secretary Kendall fly an AI-powered F-16 recently, you know, that uh, directly came from that DARPA program. And there have been others within AFRL and other offices within the Pentagon that have fed this research uh, for, for years, uh, and it's all kind of coming together today. Right. I mean, the, the idea has been kicking around for, for years, but it hasn't really ever been fielded yet. You know, if you come back to how the Air Force, how the U.S. military, or really any military, has used drones over the past, what, 20 years, 20 yeah. plus years, um, you know, it, it's, you know, you have multiple people in a ground-based station that are operating the drone um, and then that drone is usually doing you know maybe they're they're striking a target the way a, a reaper might maybe they're providing surveillance the way that a global hawk might but there's never really been a fielded platform like a cca that is essentially acting sort of like a fighter jet and is mm. able to operate quite autonomously. I think it's like a very big paradigm shift and there's quite a lot we still don't know about it. I think that the Air Force has reached a point with their crewed aircraft where the fleet size is just dwindled mm -hmm. to such an extent that they're desperate for anything that they can get to actually augment it. And right now, um, you know, there's been the recent news where the next generation um, fighter aircraft, NGAD, mm. is being delayed. Um, F-35s haven't been rolling off the uh, lines quite as quickly as they had hoped. And so CCA holds the promise of actually providing the Air Force with more aircraft in the short term and more capability and really capacity. Because these aren't going to be as capable as an F-35 or a crewed fighter jet, but they're supposed to supplement them in certain ways, provide additional targets that enemy are going to have to shoot down because they still pose a threat yeah. and and sort of suck up some of those uh, enemy missiles. Yeah, I, you know, the Air Force has said, um, you know, broadly they're looking at pairing them with all fighters out there, not just F-35, you know, that extends to F-15EX, maybe even, you know, F-16s, but this is all sort of notional. <laughs> <laughs> we have to get these things working for us and see how they pair with these platforms. You know, Boeing has talked about, for example, on the EX, the back seat, because uh, EX can, you know, come in a two-seat configuration, that that back seat uh, can be used for CCA operations. So that's just one small example of all the thinking that needs to be done to figure out how these are actually going to be used and paired with fighter jets. So let's talk about the actual the actual items themselves because there was there were five companies who were involved. Now we're down to two. Michael, give us the run through. Back in. Uh, December 2023, Breaking Defense broke the story about those five companies. Uh, originally, uh, it was uh, Boeing, uh, startup Andro, uh, General Atomics, Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman. Uh, there was a down select in April of this year, which narrowed it down to General Atomics and Andro, which surprised some people, uh, knocking out big legacy primes like Lockheed, Boeing, and Northrop. You know, the Air Force has said, their strategy has been to show that startups can do this work, uh, and that's you know part of the reason why Andrew was picked. But when you and I spoke with uh, Secretary Kendall and Secretary Hunter uh, at the Riyadh Air Show recently, uh, Secretary Hunter said very clearly, you know, all these companies needed to show that they could actually go and do this and build it, and that 
uh, Andro and General Atomics are the ones that were showed to have the best pitch. I think it's been driven, those two companies won, because they have products that are close to being ready. Mm -hmm. um, so it's about speed, right? Actually getting the first 100 delivered so you can begin to experiment with the different crewed aircraft put the smarts, the autonomy into them and figure out how you might employ them on the battlefield. But the other uh, factor that the selection of General Atom Atomics and Anderol says to me is that they're going for something that is not stealthy first, but they're not trying to foreclose that right. option in the future. So that there are probably gonna be different iterations of these, there is an element that is similar to what you see with DOD's replicator. They're not in, ex, intended to be uh, attributable in the same way. You want to reuse the CCAs, but there might be different iterations, some that are more advanced than others. Maybe you want to pair a stealthy CCA with the F-35, or maybe do the reverse where it's ahead of an F-15EX, right? And they go forward into airspace that the F-15EX couldn't. I think it's really interesting that, you know, you kind of have on one end, John General Atomics, which is sort of the legacy drone provider for, for the Air Force and for the U.S. military as a whole. And they are kind of reaching, they are reaching the end of the production line for the MQ-9 Reaper. And so this kind of is going to give them new legs. And then on the other side, you have Anduril, you know, this defense tech startup. And this is really the first really big yeah. contract, the the surely the biggest opportunity that they've ever scored. I think you hit on a really important point, though, as well. One, GA has the production capacity right now that they can repurpose and start shifting that MQ-9 line to making CCAs and getting them out there quickly. But B, I think you see the Air Force actually being more cognizant about the de defense industrial base implications of their choices and approaching this differently than they did with crewed aircraft, where you know, you'd have a decision every several decades and there's a winner takes all with these different um, iterations of CCA. They're attempting to set it up where there's constant competition and in encouraging the different um, industry partners to continue to invest in innovation along the way and to get a another chance to get a bite at the apple instead of having to wait several decades, which will hopefully benefit the aerospace industry more broadly instead of and start to build up some more capacity and resiliency instead of mm. um, sort of where we're down to where we are today. You mentioned Tranche 2, and we, we've kind of danced around it a little bit. We should just spell out here. Part of the strategy of CCA is we've down-selected these two. We have a final selection coming in 2026, production decision of which of these two will go with. And well, there's going to be... Not which, not which of these two. Okay. It could be both of them. That's true. <laughs> That's true. Or it, even the Air Force has said that, you know, the companies that were eliminated in the first cut, Boeing, Lockheed, Northrop, could come back in for a production decision. We'll see if they want to spend their internal uh, R&D on doing that. But that is also a possibility. Well, the yeah. point is there's, there's a lot potentially for other companies to jump back in, whether it's some of these same companies, new companies uh, to kind of jump in as they define these next tranches. And that is, to Stacey's point, way different than what the Air Force has actually done for 50 years of this stuff, right? So it's an interesting program in that sense. Um, just on the two aircraft that we know about, mm -hmm. the uh, General Atomics and the Andrel offering, can you just run through quickly the, the GA offering? Yeah, so um, General Atomics is pitching its Gambit. They, they call it a family uh, of systems, but it's really a, a modular drone design that they think, you know, payloads, other features could be swapped out. It was actually developed for the Air Force's uh, off-board sensing station program, the XQ-67A, and that's flying with the Air Force right now. So uh, that the design that they're pitching for CCA tracks very closely to the OBSS program. Okay. And what's Andrew about? So Andrew has Fury. Um, it's actually a drone that they bought when they, you know, that they got by default when they acquired this other startup, Blue Force Technologies. Um, so again, that's another interesting little wrinkle in this competition is that something that wasn't really developed in house. It's something that they that the airframe that they got from another um, company, and then they're you know also you know bringing their expertise with with AI with with other sorts of systems and, and plugging that in. 
I think that's a really interesting point. Both of the winners of this first tranche are privately funded, mm. right? And but they have different strengths and weaknesses. You know, Anderol is moving into big scale production for the first time. They just announced a factory that they're building, um, and where their strength is is really on the autonomous system and lattice that they have, and that is incorporated in all of their products. And then GA, you know, has been producing drones going back to the Predator. And you know has a lot of experience in uh, building out these systems for the Air Force and sort of incorporating a lot of different high-end sensors and technologies on them and understands how the Air Force operates and should be able to, you know, use that hot production line that they have to um, actually field systems sooner. So. Uh, we touched on this, but it's actually worth talking about a little bit more in depth. Uh, the Air Force has been pretty open about who the vendors are for the physical platforms, but there is a parallel effort to develop the autonomy software that will actually fly these aircraft in Val. I know that's something you heard about recently in Dayton. Last month, the Air Force at least disclosed that it awarded a contract to five different vendors to continue developing the autonomy. And that is essentially going to merge with what the platform developers are making uh, in time for flights to happen next year. So we can, we can dig into that a little bit later. But yeah, it, sometime next year, all of this is going to be merging. And how much of that we see is, I think, still to be determined. And the autonomy competition is classified, right? They're not even saying who is involved because in, we don't know if they're going to say at some point. No, yeah, the, they've been really, really quiet about that. They said five different companies. Some of them were traditional, some of them non-traditional. Each got awards. We don't know how big the awards were. We don't even know exactly when the contract was awarded. So they are keeping this very hush-hush, I'm sure, for classification, cybersecurity reasons, um, because the autonomy piece is so valuable and highly guarded. Mm -hmm.